praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. How many of us are excited to be in the presence of God this morning? Uh, our text this morning will be taken from the book of Revelations, chapter 3, from verse 20. Just one verse. Revelations, chapter 3, from verse 20. We're going to be reading from the New King James Version. Now, this passage, this is Jesus speaking. So if you're looking at this from your old Bible, you will see that the print is going to be in red, indicating that this is Jesus actually speaking. And verse 20 of Revelation 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who's speaking here? Jesus. And he says, And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, we are reminded, I was, listen, I think, if, if you've ever gone out for evangelism at any point, or you've shared the gospel with someone at any point, or someone has shared the gospel with you at any point, I am certain that out of two or three Bible passages they shared, this is one of them. You have heard this passage very well. It is a passage that says that Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And it is a passage that we typically, you know, we quote to unbelievers, you know, we tell them, you know, Jesus is at the door of your heart and he is knocking. And, you know, when you think of this passage, there's this image that comes to mind. I don't know if we can bring the image up. It is, um, can we, I thought we have the image. Okay, well, you've, you've seen that image before. Yeah, that's the one. It is the image of an artistic impression of well, someone that looks like Jesus standing outside what looks to be a wooden door. And that image tells us a few things. Number one, this image tells us that Jesus is knocking. That he is somewhere in the vicinity. He is at the door. He is at the front yard. He is at the front porch. And he wants to come in. And he is knocking at the door. Isn't it interesting that as powerful as Jesus is, Jesus will never force himself on you. He will never just budge in. He will knock at the door. And this image also tells us that as powerful as Jesus is, it requires someone on the inside to open the door and let him in. Isn't that interesting? That he gives you that choice. So even though he wants to come in, he needs you to invite him to come in. It also says an if. If any man hears my voice. I think if suggests that it won't be there forever. It didn't say when you hear my voice. It says if any man hears my voice, meaning there will be a time when you want him to come in and he won't be there. Just like if I was to come to your house and knock on your door, I ring the bell, I call you and I tell you I'm outside and you still don't open the door, I will take it you don't want me to come in. Then I will go back to my house. Amen. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be what? While he may be found. Seek him while he's still in the vicinity, suggesting he is not going to stand there indefinitely. Amen? Praise the Lord. And how does Jesus knock? We know how to knock. We knock with our knuckles, don't we? That passage, so that, that image shows him standing. But it says, it knocks because it says, if anyone hears my voice, the way Jesus knocks, he knocks with his voice. So contrary to that image, he is actually not knocking with his knuckles. So every time you open your Bible, he is knocking. He is knocking right now. Amen? And number five, I'm, and I'm sure you are wondering, why are you telling us all this? We are believers. We are Christians. Well, in this passage which we've read, which we all know very well. Revelations 3, 14 tells us that Jesus wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was talking to believers. How do we know this? Verse 14, he says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. This message wasn't to just anybody. This message was to the body of Christ. This message was to the elect. This message was to the bride of Christ. This message was for those who call themselves Christians, 
who have been saved from sin, this is the message for them. Which then begs the question, if they were Christians, what was Jesus doing outside? Because we would assume that if they were Christians, they were suppo- Jesus was so, supposed to be inside with them. Isn't that the assumption we would make? But it would appear that on this one, for this particular group of Christians, Jesus was outside. So what was he doing outside? I'm going to be quick, so please just, just, just bear with me. Now, when we think of the Laodicean church, they're known as the lukewarm church, right? You know, they were not hot, they were not cold, they were lukewarm. And, you know, Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, that is, well, that seems to be what we know about the Laodicean church. But there's something that is also missing, which I think we don't talk about often. And it is in verse 17. Verse 17. This is the Laodicean church. It says, Jesus speaking still, it says, because you say I am rich and I have become wealthy and do not need, have need of nothing. So the Laodicean church, apart from the fact that they were saved and they were, they've been saved from sin, Jesus was their savior, they were Christians, they were also a very wealthy church. When I talk about wealthy, I'm talking about in terms of dollars, in terms of currency, they were very comfortable. In fact, <laughs> this is the kind of Christians many of us really want to be. Because can you imagine how financially secure you have to be to feel the need that I don't need anything. I don't even need, I don't even need Jesus. But let's look at what verse Jesus said in verse 18 about the church in Laodicea. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold in the fire that you may be rich. Isn't that interesting? With all the money they had, Jesus says, I need you to buy from me gold. Because you are actually not rich. And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Can you, is, it, can, is it possible to have all the money in this world and still be considered and looked at as poor? And have the money to buy all the clothes? Didn't we see all the beautiful clothes we wore yesterday? Can you imagine, will someone look at them and say, look at them, what are they wearing? But Jesus said, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now, why am I saying this? And why did I use this passage? This is an example of a church that was working in power. How do we know? They were a wealthy church. The book of Deuteronomy tells us that he has given us the power to do what? To make wealth. So when we see a rich church, when we see a wealthy church, we know that certainly at least they were walking in the power of God. They were Christians. They were saved. And I believe if something happened to them and they died, they would actually go to heaven. But there was something missing. And I think what God was saying to the church in Laodicea was this. Beyond the power, beyond the wealth, beyond the power, there is something greater which I want to reveal to you, and that is my glory. We have seen the power of God here, yeah, even in this place. We have seen the power of God move. We have seen, just not too long ago, we shared the testimony of someone in this church who in this, it felt like a split second. God rolled away a reproach, just like that. So we have seen this power move, but God is saying beyond this power, I want to take you to a new dimension where I can show forth my glory. So how do we define glory? Actually, you know, just, you know, just as I say, before we define it, you know, the one mistake we tend to make is we confuse the power and the glory. But actually, there's a difference. You know this passage, the one that says, for thine is the power, sorry, well, that is the kingdom, the power and, and the glory. Amen. I just thought to make note of that. But let's just open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 17. From verse 1 to 8. Now, this is uh, an example of Jesus showing his glory while he was here on earth. This is an example of Jesus showing forth his glory while he was here on earth. I was going to read eight verses. I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing. And it says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Verse 2, and he was transfigured 
before them. He was transfigured before them. I want us to understand what really took place here. Jesus, as we know, was born of Mary. You know, he's the son of God. He is God in flesh. But for a few, well, I don't know how long it took. He, he showed three of his disciples himself, his true self. He showed them, this is the glory that I left behind. And I'm showing them to you. Verse 3, he says, sorry, verse 2. And he says, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Verse 3, and he says, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now, at this point, Moses and Elijah died. So, he meant in glory, time, time doesn't, time doesn't, is not even an equation. And, and this is the part that I found interesting. And even God said, and this is my beloved son in whom I'm well placed. So here's an example of Jesus showing forth his glory, not to everyone, but to three of his disciples. Let me just quickly explain what the power means. Well, I mean, what the definition. The power of God is God showing forth what he's able to do. What is capability, not capability is probably the wrong thing. The fact that he can do anything. The fact that there is nothing impossible for there is nothing impossible for God to do. With the power is God bringing his own power into our realm. With power, God is saying, hey, this is what I can do, and let me just show forth my power. And one thing God does, he is not afraid to show forth his power even to his own enemies. He will show forth his power even to confound his enemies. But glory, unlike that, unlike the power, God reveals his glory to only those he has a relationship with. Do you notice that, you know, everything, every power of God, the devil has been able to mimic it, at least to some extent. Power of healing, the devil can make it look healing. You know, power of prophecy, the devil can mimic it. But the devil has not been able to mimic his glory. Because for him to do that, it meant he has access to it. And since he can't access it, he has no idea what it looks like. So that is why sometimes we see some miracles and we need to be careful. Is this of God or is this of the devil? You know the story of that little girl that was prophesying to Paul and said, look at this man, they're of God. What she was saying was true. But the spirit with which she was saying it was not of God. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's open quickly our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 33 verse 18. I just want to just show another example of the difference between the power of God. Now, this is... 33 verse 18, Moses said, please, this is Moses speaking to God. Show me your glory. Now, at the point, at this point where Moses said this, Moses had seen God move in Egypt. He had seen the rod turn into snake. He had seen the plague. He had seen God uh, uh, deliver, uh, the, uh, deliver the children of Israel, taking them through the Red Sea. He had seen great and mighty things and in Exodus chapter 33, Moses still said, please show me your glory. The whole world saw his power, but God only revealed his glory to Moses. Jesus sent out 72 disciples. He had 12 disciples, right? He sent out 72, telling them, go out, cast out demons, um, cast out demons. And these disciples went out. You know who was included in those disciples? Judas Iscariot. Thomas. These two men went out with the power of God and they were casting out, the, they were casting out demons and they were healing the sick and they were raising the lame and they were opening the blind. But when Jesus wanted to show forth his glory, he only showed it to three men. Three men that he had a close relationship with. Meaning, us accessing the glory is a personal thing. Isaiah chapter 60 from verse 1 to 3. Isaiah chapter 60 from verse 1 to 3. Let's just quickly open it. And this is a passage. And this is to everybody that is reading this passage. It's talking to you. It says, arise, shine. For your light has what? And it says, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon. Meaning the person that is reading this. 
the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Because look at verse 2. Look at verse 2 of Isaiah chapter. It says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. And we privilege that God has called us out from darkness into his marvelous light. And it says, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. What happens when the glory of God is upon you? Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to your light. Because when they see the light upon you, the nations, the kings, they will come to you. So Jesus is saying to us, the church, I want to show forth my glory. I want to share my glory. I want to shine my glory upon you. And the Gentiles will leave their places and they will come to you. The only agent of his glory from the passage we read is you. No one else. It is to whoever believes that passage we just read. It is you. You as his child, you are supposed to be an instrument of his glory. I, show, I, I, I told us earlier about the, the disciples that Jesus sent out. They saw the power of God. They carried the power of God. Only three. And what was special about those three? I don't know if you've ever paid attention. What was it about those three that Jesus kept calling upon them? They were the three that were with him in Gethsemane. John, the Bible describes him as the beloved of Jesus. It was called Jesus, sorry, it was called John the Beloved. Meaning Jesus really loved him. And James was, well, it was John's brother. So why Peter? Well, look at what Peter said. In Luke 18, verse 28. This, I think, also explains why there was something about Peter Jesus loved. He said, Peter said unto Jesus, see, we have left all and followed you. We have left everything and followed you. There is no plan B, with, at least as far as Peter was concerned, there was no plan B. This is it. We sink or swim. I have surrendered all to you. There is no backup plan. There was, in what Peter was saying is, if this is it and it fails, there is nothing else that I can fall back upon. Maybe the other disciples did. But Peter said, I have left all. And that might explain why Jesus said, of all these disciples, he called this three. And he showed forth his glory unto them. Amen. Praise the Lord. How do we encounter the glory of God? How do we encounter the glory of God? It is by staying in his presence. It is by staying. I mean, it seems so obvious, doesn't it? That for you to encounter God, you actually have to stay in the presence of God. It is by staying in the presence. The Bible says when Moses went up, when Moses said he wanted to see the glory, God said, okay, come up. Come up to where you will find me. Because the power, God is, the power is God bringing forth his power from his realm into our realm. But glory is God bringing us up into his own realm. So which means he does it on his own terms and conditions. He said Moses dwelt in his presence. He went up. And when Jesus wanted to reveal his glory, he also took them up. He took them to a separate place. He took them far away from everybody to reveal himself to them. Do you realize that Jesus didn't lay hands on them to Peter, uh, Peter John, John, and James? Did, he didn't sit down and receive the glory. He says, they went up, and just like that, this transfiguration took place. This transformation took place. It happened simply because they were in the right place at the right time. They were in proximity. They were in close proximity to where Jesus is. And today we are praying and we are believing God for glory ahead, for a, a new glory. And that would only take place, ladies and gentlemen, if we remain in close proximity with God. It would only, it would only happen if we actually stay in the presence of God. John the Beloved, one of the three that Jesus revealed himself to on the transfiguration, also saw Jesus again, this time in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Well, we don't need to read it. But it says, this is what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I have it here. It says, I, John, this is him giving his account, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, 
was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 10 is actually where we're going. It says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Jesus didn't appear to him because he was on Patmos. Jesus appeared because he was in the spirit. Jesus appeared to him. And he said, verse 17 of, of, uh, verse 17 of Revelation 1, this is what John said. And when I saw him, who is him? He saw Jesus. He saw the glorified Jesus. Not the Jesus that he knew. Because remember, he was one of his disciples. He saw a different Jesus. He said, but when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he's, but he laid his right hand on me. And saying to me, do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. So we have the examples of Moses. Three disciples, including John the Beloved, that actually saw, encountered the glory of God. Just a few that encountered glory, majority encountered and saw the power. But it was only a handful that encountered the glory. And it only happened because of their closeness and their proximity to God. Amen? How do we encounter? Secondly, it's by letting God in. We're going to go back to the church of Laodicean, to the Laodicean church. It's by letting him in. In other words, it means it is not okay that Jesus is on the front porch. Maybe we are content. We say, well, he's out, at least he's outside. He's there. He's still knocking. We are not just ready to open the door. But remember what I said, it won't be there for long. A time will come when you open the door expecting to find him and he would have gone. It seems that we can be saved. It means we can be saved, but yet Jesus can still be locked outside. In other words, it means we can be saved and Jesus can be our savior, but he just isn't our Lord yet. It means that he's our savior, but there are certain things I'm holding on to that I'm not yet ready for him to release. I'm not ready to give on to him. I am holding some back. <laughs> you know, I, I went to boarding school, so, you know, many, many years ago. And, you know, you, they give you provisions, you know, for food. So you, sometimes you wanted to eat because you are hungry. But you know that you couldn't eat because if you open the provisions or you made the mistake of opening it and the wrong people were there, they will eat your food with you. So what did we do? We will hide it until the left. Even though you were hungry. Because what was the thing we would say? We don't want them to shorten our, our ration. Can I submit that maybe that was what the church of Laodiceans were doing? Because, you know, Jesus said in the book of Revelations, he says, if anyone hears my voice, I will come in and then I would dine with him. And that might explain why the Laodicean church wanted him to be outside. Because dining with him means that he comes and he dines with us. He, he actually, you know, if, let's imagine, you know, President Biden had come in yesterday and says, oh, you know, I heard about this African praise day. And they said that the food here is really good. So can you people fix me a plate? What would we do? We will lay a table before him and we'll put everything down. And we'll say to him, take as much as you want. Eat Whatever, you feel like eating pandedia mixed with this, feel free. But what we wouldn't do is just serve him what we want to serve him. And Jesus is saying the same thing that I want to come in and I want to dine with you. Meaning that I want you to lay in front of me everything that you have. Your ambitions, your finances, your thoughts, everything that you're thinking of, all your plans. I want you to lay it in front of me and I will take what I want. But many of us are not really ready to do that. We want to give him what we want to give him. So he says, if, because he says, if I come in, this is what I will do. He is actually very upfront what he is going to do. He will come in and he will dine with us. We would have to let go of some things. But then after he dines, this is what he said, and then he, you with me. That is, after I'm done eating from your table, I will then take you to my table and you can dine with me. And then I, you, can, I, you can come to my table and I can reveal. Can you imagine if Biden had said that and he said, that, now follow me to the White House and come and dine with me. 
or King Charles says, come with me. Because whatever it is that we would have given him, you know that what he is going to give us in return was going to be, <laughs> it's going to be extraordinary, far greater than what we would have given him. So the church of, La the church of God in Laodicea has essentially shortchanging themselves. Because it says, even with all the money you have, if only you knew that if you let me in, you would actually be richer than what you are. But in actual fact, with all the money you have, you are actually poor. And you are naked. Now, did you notice that Jesus didn't actually at any time condemn them for being rich? He was even saying to them, if only you knew, I could have made you much more richer. I could have even given you far greater. What you have is nothing. Amen? He says, counsel you to buy gold from me. I have the real thing. But you can only get that gold if you let me in. If you dine with me. Amen? Praise the Lord. What are the benefits of encountering the glory of God? Sorry, I'm mean, good. Just a few more minutes. You see, when, when we encounter the glory of God, I believe that the natural is suspended for the supernatural. I, I give an example. When Moses went up to encounter God, the Bible says that he spent, what, 40 days and 40 nights without eating or drinking. And nowhere in the Bible did the Bible nowhere in the, nowhere in the Bible did it record that and Moses came back hungry or weak. Meaning time was suspended. What looks normal becomes abnormal. Or what looks abnormal, sorry, becomes normal when you encounter the glory of God. Amen. Another example, time is suspended. There is we're not limited by time. And when we encounter the glory of God, you know, can I, okay, you know, we, we read testimonies here, right? We read testimonies, we share testimonies. Have you noticed that nobody ever shares a testimony? I'm not, and I'm not saying it's not a testimony, but nobody ever shares a testimony. Oh, you know, on Tuesday, I had a common cold, but then I rested, and then on Wednesday, I was fine. Is it because, isn't because God didn't do it? Of course God did it, but it is not a, it's not what we consider a big testimony. You know what I mean? But if someone said, oh, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer and the doctors gave me three to six months to live and look at me 10 years later in my life, we would all celebrate. Why? Because we consider that to be great. And it is, by the way. But when we are all basking in the glory of God, stage four cancer will be like treating common cold. Things that people look at and say it's impossible, for us it will be the norm. Amen? That is what happens when we encounter the glory of God. Amen? I don't have much time. And what is the second thing that happens when we encounter God's glory? It, it reveals who we really are to us. It reveals our inadequacies, our weaknesses. The book of Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1. Let's just quickly read that. That's going to be our final text. Isaiah chapter 6, we'll read from verse 1. This is Isaiah speaking. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I think you should just stop there. That's full stop. Because when you see God, that's it. What else are you looking for? It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. I am lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Let's just go straight to verse 5. We don't have much time. Let's go straight to verse 5. And this is what happened when Isaiah saw God. On encountering the glory of God, the great prophet Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Have you met men of God who, have, who you know that they've encountered the glory of God? If you notice one thing about them, they're surprisingly very humble. Maybe it's because they themselves can't believe that, is this me? They themselves can't, like... Me of all people. You know, David on encountering the glory of God said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, I think encountering the glory of God just humbles us because it shows forth our true self. It shows forth our weaknesses. It shows forth the mercies and the goodness of God. But when we're only just, you know, operating in the power, there's a tendency to be somewhat arrogant. 
there's a tendency to, the ego can be so big. Because you don't really understand that, yes, you are operating in the power, but don't get to carry the, don't get to carry the way God used Judas Iscariot, a thief and a liar, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to raise the lame. Meaning, God can use anybody. But when those that have encountered the glory of God, it's almost as if there is something that happens to them. Look at all of them. Just think of one or two of them. What is it about them? What do they have in common? They have this strange sense of humility. Like it's almost like I can't believe this is happening. I think it's because those that have encountered the glory of God, when they see the vastness of God, when they see how good and how great he is, they begin to realize that, who oh, am I that you're mindful of me? That song that we sang earlier says, who oh, am I that you're mindful of me? But when we are just operating in this power, there's a tendency to think, I am all that. And the glory ahead, like I said, would only come for us. We would only encounter it if when we have a close relationship, when we've opened the door, as is knocking to let him in. When we've allowed him to dine with us, when we've laid everything all in front of him, and then it is after then that he takes us up into his own chambers, into his own banqueting hall for us to dine with him. Amen? Can we close our eyes this morning? Like I said, the glory I had would only, you can be a saved so there's no point, um, you know, doing altar call. This message was to Christians. No, this was not for unbelievers. It was to believers. They were saved. And if the rapture had sounded, they probably would have gone to heaven. But God is saying to us, beyond the power, greater than that power, there is still a level, there is still a dimension that you have yet to see. There is still a level and there's a dimension that I, would take, I want to take you into. But that will require you to surrender everything. I need to be the Lord of your life. I need to have access, all access to every area. 99.9% .9 will not do. 99.9% .9 will not do. It has to be the whole thing. Just say a quick word of prayer this morning. In any areas that you feel like you're, you're, you're holding back, you said, you know, you've given God everything, but there's just one section, there's just one segment that you've yet not given up, you've just still held on to, why don't you let go? Why don't you lay it before him and, you know, whatever it takes, whatever you think is taking from you, he has something greater to give back. He has something far greater than what you're laying in front of him. in Jesus mighty name we've prayed Father we thank you thank you Lord for your word thank you Lord for this message we ask oh God that even after we share the grace and go home that you keep this message that you keep knocking Father Lord please we want you the knock to get louder Lord make sure Lord ensure that we open the door we want to open the door for you we want to let you in we want to give you all access Father, we say thank you. We commit the rest of the year unto you, the, the second half of 2024. We prophesy into July, August, September, October, November, December of 2024 that you will go ahead of us. You will make every crooked path straight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, this time when we meet, December 34, six months from now, we would have, we have cause to give you all the glory. For in Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord.